get your prompt asking you to agree. Um, Ed Marcia, you're with us now. Welcome. Um, yeah, well, we're getting close. Nine out of. Claire, welcome to you. I'm going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. So I hope everyone had a good break. Uh, we were just, uh, Hannah and I were just uh, saying how much we, even two days away from the usual routine proved to be very uh, rejuvenating for me, at least. I, 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 I didn't realize how much I would appreciate the, uh, the time off. Not that I don't love you guys, but uh, it just, it's been, it's been a, an intense uh, first half of the semester. I guess that's a fair way of saying it. Ah, Ginny, good, you're with us now, excellent. All right, well, I think we, we have enough uh, enough folks to get started. So uh, good. Well, welcome to all of you. And uh, I, um, as I say, I hope you're all rejuvenated and raring to go for the second half of the, uh, of the semester. We've got a lot, we've covered a lot of ground already, but we'll, we have more to cover and we'll, uh, we will uh, have, an, I think, a, an, an eventful next, um, next seven weeks. Speaking of events, um, the, there's several things on the horizon. Um, on Wednesday, we'll have a, a guest lecture by uh, Dr. Bethany Christensen on the history of English. I, you don't have to do any preparation for it, but please do come because she's, she's a very good lecturer uh, and it's very interesting material. She's a specialist in uh, Anglo-Saxon, that is Old English, um, but uh, also uh, uh, has taught classes on the, uh, the full range of the history of, of, of English. And she's, uh, she was in your shoes, I think I, I think I mentioned that last week, she was in your shoes uh, seven years ago as she was a student in this uh, linguistics 5901 class uh, herself. Um, so please come uh, eager to hear about the history of English. She'll, uh, she'll entertain you and, and uh, you'll come away with a much better appreciation of uh, of the uh, uh, 1500 years or so of the history of our language. Um, other events, uh, things on the horizon uh, today, actually as of, as of right now, the, the uh, first problem set is available uh, to you. It should, it should be uh, in, uh, available in Carmen. If, if someone could check, actually, I would appreciate that just to, just to be sure. I'll, I'll talk about it that is. in a, it is, all right, thank you. Good, I'll talk about that in, in just a couple minutes. Um, one other uh, item on the horizon is that on by Friday, this, this Friday, the 5th, I'd like you to uh, give me an indication of your uh, term paper topics. So uh, that's, uh, re if you haven't done so already, read over the, um, the um, uh, handout, well, or the virtual handout that you have with uh, information about the term paper assignment and uh, the various topics that I give you as, as possibilities. Uh, but uh, so please do give it a bit of thought. I, you'll have other things on your mind, I know for this class with the problem set, but uh, the, um, uh, the term paper topic, at least, you don't have to do anything more than just declare what your, what your topic is. And it can be changed if a little bit down the road, you find that, that it's, it's not quite the topic you thought it would be. But I just want to, the purpose of my uh, having you declare something by the end of this week is just so you don't forget about it and uh, to kind of keep, it's, it's my way of, to, of keeping on nudging you about, um, about the assignment. Okay, so as for the, uh, the uh, problem set, let me um, actually share my screen. I wanna share sound also this time. Um, it always defaults to that for some reason. <clears throat> um,
uh, problem set number one. Here you go. Okay, so uh, I, I, it's available now. It'll be due one week from, from now at 10 o'clock uh, next Monday. Uh, there are three problems. Please read these instructions really carefully. Uh, that's what I notice. I say this not, not only please, but please, please, please. This is pretty please, pretty please with sugar on top and so forth. Read the instructions carefully. There's a lot of material here. It's as I've told you uh, before about these the problems that it's like the homework assignments we've been doing, but on steroids. That is, there's just a lot more of it. But all of the stuff that you've done, all of the uh, methodologies that we've been uh, emphasizing, all the principles we've been talking about, all of the uh, ways in which you go about dealing with problems, uh, uh, looking over the data and organizing it and thinking it through and analyzing it and, and so forth, all of those apply to these three problems that you have in this problem set. So it's really just like a homework assignment, but there's more of it. And uh, don't get freaked out by it if you just take take a deep breath and and read through each problem and and make sure you understand what's uh, required of you. Uh, I think you'll all all be in good shape. Um, <clears throat> but please read the instructions carefully and make sure you understand just what is being asked of you. If you don't understand, ask me about it and I will clarify. But I've tr I've thought this through carefully and I've tried to lay out everything you're supposed to do in in as um, a straightforward a way as possible. Uh, this is open book, open note, uh, open everything. You can look at the readings that are in the in the Carmen site. You can look at recordings of the classes, the past recordings, if you think that will help you. Uh, the only thing you can't do is consult with classmates, colleagues, friends, or faculty other than me. So the work that you do has to be your own. It has to be there has to be a way for me to measure uh, how well you 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 do. And if you uh, taint that by talking to others or uh, then, um, then uh, I really don't have an accurate assessment of what you can do. Um, <clears throat> please take these notes seriously, C be concise and make it readable. Um, you don't have to show me all your work, but you do have to show me work that you believe is relevant to my being able to assess what you, uh, your answer. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, I want you to be concise, but at the same time, do what, do what I tell you. If I ask you to do X, then do X. If I ask you to do Y, do Y, please. And please uh, label clearly what you're answering so I don't have to go chasing all over the, the, uh, the virtual page to find out uh, what your answer is. Label, so the question A of problem one, label your answer as one point A. And there's, there's subparts to that. So do one point A, point capital A, one point A, point capital B and so forth, just so it's clear what I am uh, to, to look at on your, on your assignment. Partial credit is available for all of the, the questions. So uh, the only way you'll get a zero is, uh, for a particular question is if you don't do it. But if you attempt something, I will I try my very best to make sense of what you're doing and, to, and uh, you give yourself that way a chance uh, to get some credit. Okay. So uh, the first thing you should do uh, when you have time later on today, <clears throat> so you don't leave this to the last minute, I don't want you uh, starting to work on it on Sunday night, that would be crazy. So read over the, the three uh, problems, make sure you understand what's being asked of you. I've tried to indicate very clearly what it is you're supposed to do um, and lay, lay, laying things out in such a way that you can say, okay, I have to do A, I have to do B, I have to do C and so forth. The, um, there's some data to deal with from Quechua, some data to deal with from English, and some data from a uh, made up exercise that's based on a real on real languages. And that's, <clears throat> that's it. I, um, I hope you will take me seriously when I say I really want you to, to do well. And to, by, uh, if you if you put the time in on this, uh, if you use all of the methods and and techniques that we've been developing in the past seven weeks, you'll be in good shape to, um, to uh, figure out what the, the answers are here. Okay, are there any, um, any questions of a general nature about this? I know you haven't had, a time, had time to look at it yet. No, okay. And I will put it away, but please look it over today. If you have questions on it, 
uh, you can uh, shoot me an email. You know, I answer email all hours of the day and night. Um, okay, so uh, I think we're all set then. And uh, you'll have a chance on Wednesday, even even with uh, the uh, uh, the guest lecture by by Bethany. <coughs> you'll have a chance on Wednesday to ask me uh, questions also about the, about the problem set. All right, good. So uh, we will let's move ahead. I will uh, start by showing you in my usual manner my. Uh, our uh, my T-shirt du jour. Today's T-shirt is. I'll show you the picture of it. Today's this is the front. Today's today's T-shirt is Babylonian uh, cuneiform uh, of uh, showing Hammurabi's laws. Hammurabi was a <clears throat> Babylonian king from the nineteenth and eighteenth centuries BC. So this is very old. This is, I've shown you cuneiform before, but I haven't shown you this particular, uh, 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 this particular text, but this is one of the oldest law codes uh, in the history of the world. There's a back to my t-shirt as well, which isn't quite as interesting, but this is Hammurabi receiving the law code from the uh, god Shamash. That's the, the uh, story that was associated with the, with the uh, production of the law code. It was, um, an unusual, or a, it was a step forward as far as law codes were concerned. There were others before him uh, in that he focused on the um, on um, punishment from the for the perpetrator instead of simply uh, offering compensation for a particular uh, act. So that's uh, anyway. So this is this this will uh, come up later on in the this uh, fact that it's Babylonian will come up later on in the. Uh, in the lecture today. So that's the, uh, the first order of business. Um, uh, next, I want to, uh, let's go to our uh, in-class notes for today. Yeah, there we go. And let me open this up also. Get to those later. Okay, so, First things, first things first are um, notes for day. Okay, so there's uh, information, a little bit of information on Hammurabi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start with something that we uh, that we uh, ended with on um, on uh, Monday, a week ago. It seems like forever, but it was just a week ago. <laughs> And that was, uh, you remember we, we were, we had this uh, problem involved or this homework problem <clears throat> involving uh, the um, reconstruction of, of proto Bay, And these were the five correspondence sets across these five languages that we were looking at. And uh, we, uh, we had some a reconstruction that was quite straightforward in uh, in for some of them, T for the first set, S for the second set. We had a bit of debate about what to do with the, the remaining three sets, but we ended up finally with a reconstruction of, of uh, uh, dental T, uh, prealveolar T, and then uh, for the third and the fourth one, and then this uh, cluster involving the T and a, and a Y for this last one. But I, we then, uh, you may recall, I, I I said, well, if we go to the, the step of using the, the Y here, and remember that, that in some of the uh, languages, there was actually a Y that showed up in this last, in this last one, um, uh, in these last two uh, languages, for instance. Nope, oh, that's not what I wanna do. Anyway, you get the idea. Well, now, I, now it's a challenge. So there we go. And this was, yeah, there we go. This is what it looked like. And we decided that, that in order to account for the Y, one thing we could do was to um, put the Y into our reconstruction. And we 
<clears throat> and we ended up with a fairly happily with a with a, a set of reconstructed uh, sounds that looked like this. But uh, for proto Gavay for these five uh, sets uh, respectively. But then we said, well, look, once we once we take the step of adding uh, a why here to uh, partly to account for the the why, but also it allows us to treat these two as really the same uh, affricate in the proto language. The difference between this fourth set here and this fifth set here uh, has to do with the presence or absence of the of the why. Once we take that step, I said, well. Could we even go further and push it to to uh, uh, what we ended up saying were ridiculous limits? That is, so so if this one was, if instead of an affricate for this one, we started with just a plain the plain T that we reconstructed for this set, and then we added in the Y to give us this set, why not go further and say, well, if we have two Ys after that, uh, this is what we get out of it. If we have three, this is what we get out of it. And if we have four, this is what we get out of it. And this was meant to to be uh, ridiculous. I mean, that was the that was the point. And you were and uh, you remember that we you quite rightly decided that this was an unacceptable uh, pushing of the of the method, even though it was it, you you might justify it in terms of of uh, parsimony. That is, in terms of of Occam's razor, what you end up with is something that looks like an unnatural set of phonological contrasts. Something that no language, no human language has, where the, where the the you get these uh, contrasts between T with one, two, three, and four uh, glides following it. So we, we our ultimate decision was to uh, reject that uh, altogether. Say sure, we we still have these uh, we still have these these uh, sets to to deal with, but dealing with them in terms of <clears throat> of something that that is motivated just by parsimony, just by parsimony is not an acceptable, doesn't lead to an acceptable solution. And instead, <clears throat> these are the uh, the uh, happy ones that we will, that we would end up with, and we would eliminate these. And our our judgment there was based on on the fact that that we end up with an unnatural set of phonological contrasts as a result. And um, and I wanted to talk for a, a minute or two about uh, about this notion of naturalness, because um, there are a couple of different ways in which uh, linguists have uh, approached the. Um, first of all, let, let me just make sure everyone is on. We're, we're all on the same page that you you understand why these are, why this here would be an unacceptable uh, solution. If you don't, then. What I'm going to continue to say won't make much sense. So please, um, uh, if 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 there's anything about the last five minutes that doesn't make sense, raise your hand. Let me know. So far, it looks like everyone's okay with this. All right, good. <clears throat> so why is it unacceptable? Well, it looks like an unnatural set of phonological contrasts. What do we mean by unnatural? The um, the the way in which naturalness has been talked about in uh, in the linguistics literature basically boils down to two notions. One says that whatever is common is natural. So, it, so naturalness is more a matter of frequency across linguistically speaking, frequency across, the, uh, across known languages. And there are others who say, well, uh, whatever we find in human language has to be natural because it's there, it's present in human language. And it's something that is possible for humans to use as part of their linguistic systems. So that view can be boiled down to, uh, to the uh, slogan, whatever is, is natural. So as opposed to whatever is common or frequent is natural, uh, the altern an alternative view is to say, well, whatever is, as long as there's one instantiation of some feature, some characteristic, some entity, some construct in uh, some human language that qualifies as natural. It may not be common, it may not be frequent, but it's, it's, uh, it's natural, it's available to uh, humans as part of their, their linguistic, um, uh, as part of the material that they can, uh, upon which they can, you can build a language, so to speak. 
And I'm not going to dwell on this, but, <clears throat> but what it means then, as far as our reconstructions are concerned, is that they must be true to what we know about human language in general. They must not violate typological norms. That is uh, what we find uh, as, a, as the uh, types of human languages and the types of features that we find in human languages. Um, that's what I mean by typological norms. And they must not violate uh, what I put in quotes here, universal grammar, that is the, the constraints, the patterns, the constructs that make human language, human language. So whatever, there's a lot of debate among linguists as to what it means to talk about language universals and universal grammar. And that's a very healthy uh, debate to be sure, but they all boil down to the same uh, 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 goal of trying to understand what is it that makes human language, human language? What is it that makes our, <clears throat> our linguistic systems into uh, the way they are. So once we understand that, then we, uh, then we can use that information in our reconstructions. And uh, in fact, we, we, <coughs> excuse me, we must use them in our reconstructions because our reconstructions, as we then went on to say, re must reflect um, or must be true to the principle of uniformitarianism. That is, if the speakers of proto gebay or Proto-Indo-European or Proto-West Germanic, any of the Proto-languages that we've been uh, dealing with, Proto-Polynesian, if they were uh, speakers of natural human languages, then uh, they must conform to what we know about natural human languages. They must not violate the typological norms. They must not violate the, <coughs> the universal uh, characteristics and principles that make human language what it is. And that is, is um, what we talked about on the very first day in, as uniformitarianism. That is, the, uh, there's a uniformity across all of human language across time so that we can, what we learn about human language from the present, from our investigation of languages in the present, we can use as a basis for understanding what human languages were like uh, in the past, uniformitarianism. I'm going to take a detour now, if everyone's all uh, with me, I'm going to take a detour, which I think, I hope you'll find entertaining, um, into looking at different uh, types of uniformitarianism. This is where uh, my, yeah, where these slides come into play, and let me play them for you. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. Let me get out of this. Uh, I opened up the wrong, wrong one. Let me give me a sec here. Don't need Hammurabi anymore. Key stuff. I thought I had everything queued up, and of course I didn't. Week by week. Week eight. Uh, Oh no, oh, this is terrible. I think I, I think I deleted the wrong one. Hang on a sec. <laughs> this is like going through my, going through my trash, right? Is, uh, well, that would be awful if I could. This is what I want. This is, this is what comes of working too late at night, I think. Let's see how we, there we go. Okay, good. So, Okay, so this uh, is a uh, set of real PowerPoint slides as opposed to the sort of fake ones that I use, uh, all about time. And it has some musings that are sort of more of a philosophical nature, but <clears throat> you'll see, I'm gonna to touch ultimately on, on three, uh, three uh, main topics, historical linguistics and humanity. And that's a way of building up to different conceptions of uniformitarianism. So it's consistent with, with what I, was just talking about, and then um, kind of as a as a relevant uh, 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 epitaph, as it were, to uh, to all of this, it'll be what time means to different uh, constituencies, as you will see. Okay. So what what unites us as humans? 
Wendy O'Flaherty, who is a, a, a scholar of considerable note at the University of Chicago Divinity School. In her introduction to the um, uh, to her translations of the ancient hymns of the Rig Veda, the Rig Veda is the oldest uh, Sanskrit uh, texts that we have. There are uh, a thousand or so hymns uh, to, uh, to the gods. These are the sacred texts of Hinduism. They date from about 1200 BC. And here's how she describes what these, uh, what these sacred hymns are all about. Um, they're about conflict within the nuclear family, <clears throat> about une uneasiness, about the mystery of birth from uh, male and female parents, about the preciousness of animals, the wish for knowledge, inspiration, long life, and immortality. And in many ways, she says, <clears throat> these are themes that are, that are quite uh, common and that ring true even uh, today for us. Now, uh, uh, in a, in another, even though it's some 3,000 years uh, in the past. Similarly, Matt Stolper, also a Chicago, University of Chicago professor who works on the uh, Chicago uh, Assyrian Dictionary, this is what he had to say about the contents of Assyrian texts. They express, these are from uh, Hammurabi's uh, era. So these are, are uh, even older than in some ways than, than some of the texts, some of the hymns of the Rig Veda. Uh, so some nearly 4,000 years old, some of them. They express joy, anxiety, and disappointment about uh, the same uh, things that provoke us, uh, to, same events that provoke us today, a child's birth, bad harvests, money troubles, uh, boastful leaders. And, um, wait a minute. Uh, okay, that's what I want. A lot of what you see is absolutely recognizable. People expressing um, <clears throat> fear and anger, expressing love, asking for love. There are inscriptions from kings that tell you how great they are and inscriptions from others who tell you those guys weren't so great. And there's a, a lot of, sorry. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's also a lot of ancient versions of your check is in the mail. And there's a common phrase in old Babylonian letters that literally means don't worry about a thing. Don't worry, be happy, in other words. <clears throat> and there's another ancient uh, perspective that we can bring into play here. There was a Hittite king, uh, King Hattusilis, from the um, uh, second millennium BC. So again, 3,000 or so years uh, or more in, in, the, in the past. And uh, a scholar, uh, Craig Melcher, who actually was at, uh, he and I were, were uh, uh, comrades at, uh, in graduate school together. Uh, he writes about a, a Hittite text that, that documents the last minutes of life of the Hittite king, Hattusili. And what was happening as best he could reconstruct is that Hattusili was apparently dictating his last will and testament to a scribe. And the scribe was dutifully writing things down <clears throat> using cuneiform uh, uh, for, uh, for Hittite, not Babylonian, but adapted for Hittite. Um, and as, as uh, Hattusili was dictating in this way uh, to the scribe who was writing things down, uh, he suffered a, 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 what was ultimately a fatal or near fatal episode. He, he finished the final, the official dictation at the end, but then he, something happened and he just kept on uh, talking and the scribe, this is, this is a really cool thing, the scribe kept on writing things down because he hadn't been told to stop. So this is almost like a recording from 3,500 years ago. It's as close as we can get to the recording of actual speech from 3,500 years ago. Um, so Hattusili <clears throat> had this episode of some sort, and he began reflecting in ways that seem almost incoherent about his impending death. He knew that, he, that, that the end was near, and he ended with an exhortation to a woman that he had been calling for, and he said, protect me on your bosom from the earth. And as far as we know, those were his last, uh, his real last words, protect me on the bosom, uh, on your bosom from the earth, addressing this, this woman figure that he had in his brain as he was having this near fatal uh, or fatal ultimately episode. <clears throat> now, this is how Melcher interprets these last words. He, he, he recognizes that the Hittites practice burial and not cremation, and, uh, but they believed in afterlife and in um, the uh, uh, immortality in divine form for its kings. So Melchert then uh, gives this interpretation of things. 
Despite assurances of happy immortality, the dying Hattusili is frightened. He sees only the immediate certainty that he will soon be put down in, into the cold, dark earth alone. And like many a poor mortal uh, since, he finds this a terrifying prospect. There seems to be little fundamental difference. This is the, the point I really want you to focus on. There seems to be little fundamental difference between us, that is we, uh, uh, us today uh, uh, in the 20, 20th century when he was writing uh, towards the end of the 20th century, between us and ancient peoples when it comes to facing death. Hattusilis' words uh, speak to us directly across the centuries. His fear is palpable. We not only at once understand, but also are moved by his agony and his desperate cry for his loved one's tender comfort, whoever this woman was that he was uh, invoking. These emotions are, not, are neither Hittite nor, since Hittite is an Indo-European language, he says they're neither Hittite nor Indo-European, neither ancient nor modern, but simply human. So this is a way in which we, we uh, are linked uniformitarianly, if you will, be, uh, with uh, humans that we, that we have evidence of uh, in these texts from 3,500 years or so ago. So this brings us then to uniformitarianism. Does anyone remember um, what the, <coughs> what the um, starting point for uniformitarianism was? Where we, um, what, what, do you remember that we, this came out of our, our consideration of, uh, of uh, Mendenhall laboratories on campus? Does anyone recall the first, uh, the first instantiation of, of uniformitarianism that we ran into? Mendenhall. That wasn't uniformitarian. That was where that there it was, what is located in Mendenhall was what uh, oh was, just what the led geology us. and yeah exactly. So there was a geological notion of uniformitarianism that Charles Lyell in the nineteenth century uh, first put put forward. And what he was was trying to do was to make sense of the the uh, geological layering by reference to uh, geological. Uh, processes and, and events that, that he, he was witnessing in his field work today. So erosion, for instance, or, or the uh, pressure that, that, that different rocks and so forth put on one another. I'm not a geologist, so I'm speaking uh, just very loosely here. <clears throat> so <coughs> uniformitarianism that is using the present to gain an understanding of the past was first emerged out of, uh, out of geology. So we have a geological uniformitarianism. We then extended that to, um, to uh, linguistic uniformitarianism, and we drew on, the, especially on the, uh, uh, on the work of William Lebov, who has overtly said that you can use the present to explain the past as far as language is concerned. And that's really what is relevant for, for uh, our um, uh, rejecting that crazy reconstruction for proto Bay with all of the whys uh, in, involved, uh, because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't stand up to the criterion of being true to what we know about human language. How do we know things about human language? By looking at language today in the present. So it's using the present to give us a window into what, what was going on in the past. So we have geological uniformitarianism in Lyell's work. Uh, Lebov has adapted that and brought that to the fore. Uh, in our understanding of what we could call linguistic uniformitarianism. And what we've just witnessed with the, uh, what, what Wendy O'Flaherty said about the Rig Veda, <clears throat> what uh, Matt Stolper said about uh, Babylonian texts, law codes, for instance, um, and what um, Melchert said about uh, the Hittite king Hattusili as he was facing his death, what we really have there is something we could call humanistic uniformitarianism. So this is a third type of, of uniformitarianism that our investigations of the past lead us to. And we're led to this through the study of, of what ancient texts uh, give us, how much we as humans today are like humans in the past is really what, uh, what it means, not just in terms of our language usage and not just in terms of the physical environment that we live in, that's what the geological uniformitarianism would, would give us, but in terms of how we approach the world as, as humans, what, we, what is important to us and, 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 uh, and how we interact with the world and how we interact with, with others. So let me, uh, that's, this is all pretty heavy stuff, as I said, somewhat philosophical. So let me 
uh, give us a bit of, a, of an interlude still related to time. And this is a joke I heard some time ago. A man asks God, what is a million years like to you? And God answers, it's like a second. The guy says, huh, so what is a million dollars like to you? And God answers, oh, it's like a penny, my son. So the man asks, so God, can I borrow a penny? And God answers, sure, let me get back to you in a second. So I hope you find that amusing. I thought it was really funny and very apropos to our understanding of, of uh, the time dimension, <clears throat> uh, which is really what historical linguistics is all about, is, is trying to make sense of the, the time dimension as it pertains to, to language. So I'd like to just build on that a bit more as we uh, go through this. And we'll start by looking at some <clears throat> definitions of time. You know that I love the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED. Um, and this is the definition that we find for time in the OED, a finite extent or stretch of continued existence as the interval separating two successive events or actions or the period during which an action condition or state continues. I think that's a reasonable definition. Anyone have any reactions to that? Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. It's hard writing definitions, you might, you might, as you might, if you've ever tried to do that. Uh, and, uh, and I think this, this, is, this is a pretty good uh, statement. <clears throat> um, here's a, 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 a professor, actually a chair of the, of the uh, astronomy department, David Weinberg, a friend of mine. This is how he uh, and astrophysicists talk about, you know, they need to think about time, obviously, in somewhat different ways from us, but uh, from us in uh, the historical sciences. But for him, he says, time is that in which things change. And we might amend that using the, uh, uh, a somewhat uh, clever verbiage that my uh, colleague Hans Hock, the author of, of the uh, textbooks that you've been uh, looking at, uh, time is, is that in which shift happens. We can, um, time is that in which uh, shift uh, happens. So there, there are similarities here. The OED is somewhat more fleshed out, but I think I like David Weinberg's way uh, of putting it. Time is that in which things change, whatever that is. Stuff happens, sh uh, shift happens, as Hans Hock would say. <clears throat> we find reflections of, of the notions of time and, and perceptions of time and so forth in literary arts. Uh, Shakespeare uh, in The Tempest notes that what's past is prologue. That is, what's past is the prologue, that is the, the beginnings of, uh, it, it sets the stage for what comes afterwards. And William Faulkner uh, in his uh, Requiem for a Nun said, uh, the past is never dead, it's not even past. So it's always with us in a certain sense. He was viewing this from a kind of literary uh, uh, point of view, but it's, it's uh, we'll, we'll see that there's kind of a, a way of, channeling this into a, uh, into a linguistic uh, insight, I believe. And we see this also in music. Um, the, uh, there was an uh, 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 American Calypso, a Caribbean uh, singer, Harry Belafonte, I think he's still alive, who, this was one of my mother's favorite uh, uh, lines from, uh, from musical lyrics. Time makes fool of man, they say, take me back to that distant day, but especially the time making fool of us is, is interesting. Other musical uh, perspectives, the Rolling Stones said time, time, time is on my side. Yes, it is. And there are even better ones. Uh, the Grateful Dead asked the question. Oh, oh, what I want to know, oh, where does the time go? Could you all hear that? Yes, yes, good. Okay, good. So the sound worked. So where does the time go? What is the answer to that? Where does time go? Well, the Steve Miller band had an answer. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. And if you don't like that answer, Bob Dylan had an answer for us. Past as the present now will later be past. We can get a more scientific answer. Even though Bob Dylan was a Nobel Prize winner, he was not a physicist. So we can get an answer from, from Albert Einstein, Nobel Prize 
winning physicist, the distinction between the past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. <clears throat> Viewed from the perspective of, of a theory of relativity, uh, that, that actually makes, makes sense. We'll see that it has a linguistic dimension as well. And there's a literary confirmation of that. T.S. Eliot, also a Nobel Prize winner, uh, in his four quartets wrote, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past, which is really essentially what, uh, what Einstein was saying about this distinction between present, past, and future, just a, a stubborn uh, and persistent illusion. We can have a more sort of concrete uh, uh, example of present, past, and future uh, sort of all balled up in one by looking at, at weather in Columbus. That's always a, a, uh, a, top, a, a topic for discussion. What's the weather like? And if you look at a, a month like April, we could look at March as well, but I haven't had the stats here for, for uh, April, May, and June. <clears throat> uh, we can see that April is part March and part May in its weather. So it's partly looking ahead to May, but also partly uh, lagging behind, if you will. The average high and the low temperatures this past spring last year in, uh, in uh, Columbus looked like this. So April has some March-like days and some May-like days, and the same holds for each month and its neighbors. So the present, past, uh, and future, as it were, weather-wise, are all uh, rolled up in one in any one month. Now, how would we apply this to language, the Einstein's view and Eliot's view? Of, um, <clears throat> We can think about, and I think I've made this point in lectures uh, before, but we can um, uh, say that at any given point in time, what we can call synchrony, any syn synchron synchronic uh, point in, the, in time uh, for a language that we are interested in. A language is a blend of material that's, and I use that in, in sort of the intended uh, in the broadest uh, sense really. Um, <clears throat> a blend of material that is to say sounds, constructions, vocabulary, and so forth that are carried over from the past. This is what I've, when, I've, when we've talked about stability in language, what doesn't change over time being an interest, something of interest to us. But so, it, so there's material that's carried over from the past mixed together with innovations. We've talked a lot about innovations. We focused, have focused a lot on innovations, on, on changes. <clears throat> so uh, mixed together with uh, innovative, alterations to the material in the system, including additions. So additions or, 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 or changes of some sort. And what that gives us then uh, is that in the innovations, we really have uh, the future of the language, where the language is heading. And each synchronic moment that we look at is really a present state. So that means that the, the, the past, the things that carry over from the past, the present, that is the present state that we uh, are examining or existing in, and the future all come together in language at any identifiable synchronic stage that we're looking at. So in that sense, Einstein and Eliot, their view about past, present, and future, we can apply it to language and, and, uh, and come, out, come away with a, uh, a sort of uh, uh, a common sense notion of what it means to talk about past, present, and future being available uh, in a certain sense, even at a synchronic point in time. Now there's, <clears throat> and this is something that's come up in already in our discussions, uh, there's a sort of an ongoing tension in language between continuity and change. This is a constant for any language, what, con what continues it is what's stable across time uh, versus what changes across time. And this is really true as I think I've, I've emphasized for virtually all human institutions. Now, ling as linguists, we're able to take a long view of time and diachrony. Uh, and the tools that we have available to us are first and foremost, the comparative method. It gives us a way of, of oops, a way of uh, sort of vaulting back, jumping back into the past. But we also have uh, philo philology and the philological interpretation of inscriptions and texts like uh, uh, Hammurabi's law code, for instance from the past, including the, the recent past. So we can go back a hundred years and, and learn something about, um, about uh, uh, what's happened in, in 
in relatively short time periods. <clears throat> and we can uh, also uh, gain insights from the analysis and comparison of, <clears throat> of corpora of spoken and written uh, language, uh, as well as if you remember what we said about the uh, uh, films from the uh, 1911 or so of, of American Sign Language from video uh, uh, as well, to the extent that it's available, video and audio recordings. And what these allow us to do is to see, oops, is to see the uh, distant, even unrecorded past, and to discern long-term developments that appear to be cycles. So one uh, that's, that's often mentioned is, um, for those of you who know French, you, um, French at one stage had a single negation marker, simply the uh, particle ne with a verb. That developed into uh, a kind of emphatic double negation uh, in, in keeping uh, the, the ne there with the verb, but adding uh, various emphatic uh, elements, one of which was the word pa, meaning step. So it was not a step, not, which is like saying not a bit, not, not at all. But what we find is that this cycles back into single negation as the uh, ne has been dropping out in, in uh, colloquial usage and uh, uh, um, tied to probably a fast speech reduction of some sort. So that what we have in colloquial French today is <clears throat> simply the verb plus pa. So there's a kind of cyclical development there. And that's only, that kind of cycle is only available really by, uh, by th these kinds of historical analytic tools that we have available to us uh, as, uh, as linguists with this long view of time and diachrony. Now, Ferdinand de Saussure, who I'll talk about a bit at the, uh, at the end uh, here, um, <clears throat> famous Swiss linguist from the uh, 19th uh, century into the early 20th century. He wrote this Cours de Linguistique Générale, a, a course of general linguistics that, that really helped to set linguistics on a scientific uh, footing. And he, he made this interesting observation. He said, to the speech community, synchrony is the only true reality. Would someone like to, uh, to take a, a stab at unpacking that? Why is synchrony the only true reality to the speech community, that is to speakers at, uh, in the speech community. Does anyone see what, 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 uh, what the saussure was, was getting at? There's no reason to assume that speakers have any access to diachronic observations. Exactly, speakers don't have any access to diachronic observations, nor can they see it, look ahead into the future. So all that they live with is their is the reality of the present moment. Now, if the present moment is, as we uh, said here, something, something that combines in certain ways some indications, carryovers from the past, along with, with hints as to where the language is headed, then in a certain sense, uh, it, it doesn't mean that the time is, <clears throat> is or the time dimension is completely alien to us as speakers, but our only reality is what we, what we have in the present moment. But what is synchrony for a speaker? It's, this is worth uh, considering, especially in light of what I was, uh, said earlier about past, present, and future kind of coming together. Uh, in a recent article in, uh, in the journal Language, uh, Jen Hay and, and Paul Folks talk about what they, what they refer to as remembered time the layers of learning from speakers' discussions of different times in their lives. If individuals store, let's say, phonetically detailed memories over a long time period, they may access older variants when talking about older events. In other words, if there's linguistic change in progress, the nature of that change uh, should be replicated by speakers visible across their speech about distant versus recent events. So they, they recognize that speakers have access to what we talked about the very early um, I think the first day or the first week, we talked about as a personal diachrony. We all uh, unfold in time, as it were. We, we, we grow up, we exist in time, we, but we, we live in the present moment, but we can remember the past, uh, our own past, at least. <clears throat> so speakers really live in what might be referred to as an extended present, or philosophers refer to this as the specious present. And this extended present is really a mild kind of diachrony based on speaker's personal diachrony. 
And we can augment that. You remember we, uh, we talked in the uh, first uh, uh, week or so, we talked about <clears throat> the apparent time construct so that because society has not just everyone at the same age or not just blocks of speakers in, in, in at different ages, but rather a continuum from very old to very young, um, <clears throat> we, can get a, we can get a glimpse of what the language must have been like earlier by look by seeing what is the uh, speech of of uh, seventy year olds, eighty year olds, ninety year olds uh, around us. It's not that they can't change throughout the lifetime, <clears throat> but there is a certain uh, fixity that <clears throat> that sets in to one's language use uh, round about your the end of your teens or into your twenties or your young adult uh, phase. So. Um, so we have then in this extended present, really, a, as I say, a mild kind of diachrony based on speakers' personal diachrony, but also augmented by the apparent time construct, what you uh, witness uh, in uh, the language of older people around you, especially compared to younger speakers. And just to give you a, a practical uh, glimpse of, of this <clears throat> extended present, this is, this is uh, a, uh, something you see commonly on on the road when you're when you're driving. Uh, this is from a uh, I think uh, from a, an intersection near <clears throat> excuse me near uh, Ohio Stadium. I can't remember the <laughs> I haven't been on campus much lately. I don't remember the names of the of the streets. But this is uh, um, uh, here we we see this is what I want you to focus on: signal operation change. Now suppose you were coming to that for the very first time. You had never been at that intersection before. Would this would this sign mean anything to you? Would it tell you, would it give you any important information? Kyle, you're shaking your head, why not? If you didn't know how it worked before, how it works now is, how it worked then really isn't relevant to you. Exactly, it's irrelevant. So this, this only makes sense if you've been there before and if you have access that is through your own personal diachrony to, the way the signal operated previously on your on your previous uh, visits to that intersection. So this uh, this uh, seemingly mundane sign actually <clears throat> um, embodies, I think, a very interesting claim about about um, uh, humans' interaction with time. That is that it, it that it says signal operation change. That implies that you are aware of the fact that it used to be something different, and there. They're, they want to draw, to draw your attention to the fact that there has been a, 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 uh, a change in the signal operation. So that ends my uh, sort of philosophizing about time and, and, and such, but um, I, I wanna end, uh, I have more to, to tell you about sort of a purely linguistic nature, but I, I wanna end this little, this phase of today with um, this, uh, since I mentioned Ferdinand de Saussure, I want you to see how how you um, uh, how he relates to you because there's actually a direct lineal descent of the sort that we've talked about in language between that connects you to Ferdinand de Saussure. <clears throat> he was a Swiss linguist in the uh, second half of the 19th and into the early 20th century. As I said, very prominent, very famous. You may have heard of him. Uh, this arrow I'm using to indicate that he was a teacher too. So Ferdinand de Saussure was a teacher of Antoine Meillet, who was a probably the leading uh, Indo-Europeanist of his era in the uh, second half of the 19th century and into the first uh, half of the 20th century. Uh, Meillet was a teacher to Emile Benveniste, another uh, French linguist, Indo-Europeanist of considerable note, maybe not quite as, as, as uh, prolific and, and famous as Meillet, but, but, uh, oops, but famous in his own right. Benveniste was <clears throat> the uh, teacher during, oops, I keep, oh, well, anyway, this will work. Uh, it was a teacher of um, Calvert Watkins, who I've mentioned to you, I think a couple of times uh, as one of my mentors. He was the one who said, for instance, that if you're gonna do the comparative method, the first thing is you gotta know what to compare. I've mentioned that a few times uh, to you in class. So, so Benveniste uh, taught Watkins when Watkins spent some time in Paris uh, when he was a, a graduate student. And, and uh, Cal uh, was one of my mentors. And then, so this is me here, I'm still alive, still with you. And here are you all 
benefiting from the wisdom that I gained from Watkins, that he gained from Bambanese, that he gained from Mayet, that he gained from Ferdinand de Saussure. So there is actually a direct lineal connection between Ferdinand de Saussure and each one of you. And I personally think that's, that you should consider that to be pretty exciting. Um, so there you have it. Okay, any, any questions on, on this? I, um, this is maybe a little bit different from other, other uh, presentations that we've done, uh, but I will, but I want to, um, if, I, if there are no questions, I wanna explore a little bit more this question of, of uh, synchrony and diachrony. And uh, <clears throat> in particular, and this might seem a little bit uh, heavy going, but it's not, uh, it, it will give you a review of, of what we've been talking about with regard to um, uh, cr um, relative chronology of, of, uh, of, of rules. <coughs> There's a sort of philosophical side to, to this as well. But I want to, uh, especially, uh, we've, we've talked about the um, diachronic ordering of changes, what we refer to as relative uh, chronology in our, um, in our discussion, for instance, of, of, um, uh, of Polynesian and, uh, and even in the uh, Indo-Iranian problem that you uh, worked on uh, last week. Um, <clears throat> and I, and I, I think you may have run into uh, the notion of ordering of, of rules synchronically in some of the um, uh, classes that you, other linguistics classes that you've taken. So I want, but I want to, I want ultimately to contrast synchronic ordering of rules with diachronic ordering of rules. The diachronic ordering of rules is what we've called relative chronology. But um, how many of you have run into uh, synchronic ordering in say your phonology class or morphology? Is, there another, is this a notion that, that uh, rings a bell? If not, I'm gonna go through an example so you, you can see what it is that I have in mind. Um, keep an open mind, speaking of minds. So, um, we know that 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 in English there are uh, three different realizations for the so-called S plural. <clears throat> it can be just a simple S. It can be a Z, or it can be a vowel plus Z. Uz, in other words. So we see the the plain S in cats, the Z in dogs, and the Uz form with an extra uh, vowel there in a word like glasses. Now. I don't know how you've, how, I, I don't know if exactly how you've had this uh, uh, so-called allomorphy presented in, in classes that you've had in the past, but <clears throat> um, just bear with me because I'm gonna give you one uh, analysis of this allomorphy. You may, you may have run into others, but this is one analysis and, and, and it, it makes my point about synchronic ordering. So, so bear with me on this. Suppose we say the basic form of the plural is uz, that is the, the form with the uh, vowel. And I'll put it in uh, bracket or in slashes like that to indicate that this is a, a basic form, a starting point. <clears throat> if this is the basic form of the plural, then clearly we need to get rid of the schwa at some point uh, in order to, uh, to produce cats.
Did I lose you all at some point? You vanished from my screen. Yeah, but you're all back. Am I back? You can see me, you can hear me. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, what was the last thing that anyone remembers me saying? This is, I, I, I guess I need to share my screen again. Um, what I was doing, I don't know what happened with that. Here you had just talked about the deletion rule for the schwa. Okay, so we got as far as, as the plural of cats being, in terms of its starting point, its underlying starting point, it would be cat plus us, because we decided that the basic form of the plural was us. Um, the, we would, we need, since we ultimately want to get, since we ultimately want to get to cats, um, we ultimately want to get to cats. Um, <clears throat> We need to delete the schwa. And I just wanted, so what, what do we get when we delete the schwa? That's what I think that was the last thing I asked you before I noticed that, that I had lost you all together. Uh, uh, so if we start with cat plus us, we get rid of the schwa, what do we end up with? What, what is our intermediate stage at this point? And I can see you all. So I know, I know you, you're, you hear me. I know, you, I know you're with me this time. So what is, what is the, uh, someone says it, and the answer is cat plus z. Thank you, Kenna. Uh, cat plus z is this sort of intermediate stage after the, the schwa deletion uh, takes place. And how do we get to cats with an S is by a voicing assimilation rule that the Z here turns into an S after a voiceless consonant. This should be fairly straightforward. You might have seen other analyses of, of um, the uh, production of plurals in, in English that start with S or Z as the starting point and, in, and insert a schwa uh, in a word like glasses. But I was starting with, uh, uh, this is the analysis that I wanted to, to focus on. Start with us, get rid of the schwa, and then we necessarily have to voice the, um, <clears throat> the Z to an S giving you cats. So what is the synchronic order of the schwa deletion and the voicing assimilation? That's, that's what I want you to, to consider. Uh, okay. Um, what is the uh, synchronic order that we need for these two rules? And we can, we can talk about them as rules of, uh, of, of uh, the phonology or the morphophonology of, uh, of English. What is the order? Well, how did we get from cat is to cats? It's right here in front of you. Someone say it though. First we needed to delete the schwa and then we had to have the voicing assimilation. Right, so first delete the schwa and then have voicing assimilation and we get cats out of that and everyone's happy. <clears throat> How do we know that has to be that order? Well, if you try the reverse order, the opposite order, the voicing assimilation rule is not applicable. Why is it not applicable here to cat plus is? Um, because schwa is it a voiceless consonant or a consonant? <laughs> yeah, well, schwa is not a consonant. Yep. Uh, yeah, right. So, uh, so this rule would not, would not be active. It wouldn't be available. It wouldn't be applicable here. And it, <clears throat> but then the deletion would be applicable because the deletion says, get rid of the schwa after a non sibilant. So you'd get rid of the schwa and what would we end up with then? Cat, cat, which is not English. It's, and so it's not what we want. We can strike it from the record. We can show that our displeasure with it, but this is not the ordering of these two changes, uh, rules, these two rules. Okay, everyone clear with, this is, this is an analysis and I want you to, to, to uh, I, I wanna work with this analysis. Uh, so even if, even if you're thinking to yourself, well, why do you start with us? Just say, if we start with us, this is what we have to, to do in order to get to the form cats. You need these two, uh, synchronic rules, the deletion of the schwa and the voicing assimilation, and they need to take place in this order. Okay, everyone with me on that? Yeah, 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 okay. 
So, <clears throat> so now we uh, can ask these questions of a more philosophical nature. And I want you to, to think about this. Where does this order, this ordering that we, uh, in, that we say is necessary to get the right results, where does that order reside? What, what, where is it located? These, and I put these in quotes because it's, there's not a, necessarily a physical location, but think about, about uh, where, where uh, uh, what we, in, in what entity, in what, in, in, where are we positing this ordering of, uh, as, as holding? I want, I want you to, to think about that. And I would love for someone to, to, to uh, try to give me an answer to this. So I can wait a little longer until the silence starts getting uncomfortable for everyone. Someone like to, to, take a, to just, Take a stab at it. Maybe, maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it doesn't reside anywhere. And, and that would be your answer. So it's a no, it, nowhere would be the answer. Or is there some specific place in a, in a, in a certain sense where it, where it resides, where it would be located? No, no one wanted. I could be vague and just say it resides in the speaker's mind. Okay, good. Well, that's not vague. I mean, that, that's, that's much more specific than saying nowhere, right? You're saying it there. So somewhere in the speaker's mind, and what, and here's an interpretation of that. I'm constructing a sort of mini grammar of English that focuses on the way in which plurals with with the this this us morpheme uh, are are generated, are are realized, um, are instantiated, and uh, in that description which is trying to model what speakers have in their, in their minds, what, what their internal grammar is. In that model, the, um, the, there's an ordering that's necessary between these, uh, these two uh, rules uh, that, that serve to generate the, um, the, uh, the ordering. So we could answer this by saying, <clears throat> in a speaker's mind, or alternatively, in the, the grammar, and I'm gonna put grammar in quotes because it's sort of a loaded term, in the grammar that models the uh, speaker's behavior. And really that's what we're trying to do with, with our, with, when we construct an analysis <clears throat> of a linguistic analysis, we're trying to, to model what speakers uh, are actually doing when they create a plural like cats. So it's so uh, uh, Oscar's point is, is right. It's vague, but it's but we can we can flesh it out a little bit by saying that yes, it's in the speaker's mind, and what we're positing uh, as uh, in our analysis is that is a model that reflects what speakers do when they uh, generate a form like cats. Now here's an even more <clears throat> um, philosophical set of questions: What is the ontological status of this ordering? What kind of entity is it? What kind of thing is it? Is it, is it a, a tangible kind of construct? Is it, a, uh, is it something that is built into the way the, the, the model uh, generates a form like cats out of a starting point like cat is? Anyone have a, have a thought about that? <clears throat> let me let me ask it this way: Is it is it is it uh, something tangible? No, it isn't. I mean, it's what it, maybe there are neurons that fire or something like that, and and but that's not. It, it's it that would be the extent of it of it being uh, tangible. So in terms of <clears throat> of its ontological status, which just sounds like a very weighty term, but it just means what kind of thing is it? It's it's something that's imposed by our modeling. It's imposed by our analysis. It's, it doesn't exist sort of independently as an entity that you could put a finger on, so to speak, or, put a, or, or point to a neuron uh, or, 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 or the like uh, for. So it's, it's, it's a very abstract kind of 
uh, uh, kind of uh, entity at best. <clears throat> okay, are, are you? Is everyone okay with with that? You're, you you because I, I want you to I want you to keep that in mind and let's contrast it with the historical ordering of the, the relative chronology of the sort that we saw with the Proto-Polynesian uh, development into Hawaiian, <coughs> where we, we had the, the change of K to a glottal stop, we said happened before the uh, Ts turned into K. And remember our reasoning for that is that if T turned into K first, then by regularity of sound change and by the phonetic nature of sound change, all Ks, the original Ks and the secondarily created Ks would end up as a glottal stop, which was contrary to the facts, it was different from what the facts told us. So therefore we said this change was ordered, had to be chronologically ordered. It's relative chronology relative to this other change was that, was that K to glottal stop happened before T became K. You all remember that? We've had other instances of, of, of ordering relationships, chronological relationships uh, between uh, different uh, uh, changes that we've, that our analyses have posited. Okay, I see at least one person uh, is with me, so that's good, thank you. Um, so let's, let's ask the same questions then about this chronological, this relative chronology of uh, from Proto-Polynesian, uh, the two changes into Hawaiian. Where does this order reside? Where is it located? <clears throat> Anyone want to take a stab at that? Anyone? Is it as amorphous, as abstract as the synchronic ordering? No, it exists in time. It exists in time, in real time. We remember, and now think back to uniformitarianism, what we were saying, that, that, that we, we posit that the Proto-Polynesians were humans just like we are. Uh, they, <clears throat> they existed in speech communities just like we do. And so at some point, there was an, an actual historical event of this K turning into a, a, a glottal stop that affected a subset of the Proto-Polynesian speech community. And that happened sometime before, we don't know because it's relative chronology, not absolute chronology. That happened sometime before the uh, change in a later uh, speech community of T turning into K. So these are historical events. We can say these actually took place. And my mentor, Calvert Watkins, who, who I mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, he said, this is, this is, if you think about it, this is really a very powerful, remarkable thing to be able to say. Our methodology allows us to, to pinpoint to, uh, what, what the relative chronology of two distinct historical events was without any documentation, just working from the linguistic evidence alone, from the comparative evidence alone. <clears throat> and you might imagine, since I've uh, been dwelling on these things uh, for seven weeks now, and and uh, I was very much affected by Calvert Watkins. That really made that really resonated with me. I thought, wow, that is really cool. Just the linguistic evidence alone is giving us a basis for saying that these two historical events uh, existed, and we can pinpoint when they existed relative to one another. So they they reside in history. They they reside in real time. They aren't these amorphous things that, that are part of our, our abstract analysis of, how, of modeling what speakers do synchronically. These were actual historical events. And that then is the answer to these last questions of the <clears throat> ontological status of this ordering. What kind of entity uh, is it? Each one was a real historical event. So, <clears throat> so there are parallels, real parallels between uh, what we see in synchronic ordering and what we see in diachronic relative chronology, but they the, they differ considerably in terms of their um, their ontological status. What are these entities that we're talking about when we say that there's a syn there are synchronic rules and they're ordered in this way, as opposed to saying there are diachronic historical 
developments, historical changes, and they were uh, ordered uh, chronologically relative to one another in this way. They're, they're, they're parallel in certain respects, the same kinds of methods lead us there, but the, um, but the ontological status of what it is that we're dealing with uh, differs uh, in each case. Now, I, I don't know, uh, just to, to sort of uh, point you in the direction of Wednesday's class on, uh, uh, on the history of English, <clears throat> this here actually represents the uh, history of, of the plural marker in English. That is, historically, there was a, the us was the older uh, form of the plural in, in English. So the plural of stone was stanus with a, with a, stanus with a, uh, a, a whole syllable. So that this schwa deletion rule and the voicing assimilation, these were the historical uh, uh, sound changes that actually took place. So in this case, the synchronic analysis that I'm sort of circling here um, mirrors, reflects the, uh, the diachronic developments. And uh, that's something which I want you to sort of park in the back of your mind somewhere, but we'll pull it out in about five weeks when we talk about the relationship between synchronic theory and theorizing and uh, diachronic developments. Okay, so that's uh, all I have for you for today. We're almost out of time. Are there any questions about this or about anything that, that came up today or uh, about the problem set, about the lecture on Wednesday, about, the, about anything? No, you're all good? Yep, I see smiles, so that's, I'll take that as a good sign. Okay, so Wednesday, please be prompt um, and show up at, at 1110 uh, so Bethany can get started. She actually has to end a few minutes early. So, um, so if, if you have questions about the problem set by then, I'll, I'll take them in the last uh, five or 10 minutes after uh, she, ha she has to leave for another meeting. Um, but you'll have, you'll have time to ask questions. But in the meantime, read over the problem set. You can query me right away uh, later on today if you have questions uh, or we can discuss them on, on Wednesday, but please do have a look at it. Okay, so thank you all very much uh, and uh, see you on Wednesday then. So long, take care everyone. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good. And I'm going to stop recording. Yes.